Hi everyone, this is Dr. Matecki back for the first of three short videos on Chapter 8's material. So um, I usually skip over several slides as I'm going through this, but I think for the most part I'm going to hit on just about everything in the, in the complete slide deck for this chapter. Um, try to go through some of the initial slides more quickly and then spend some time on the graph and the quantitative examples. Hi, this is Dr. Matecki back to talk about um, Chapter 8, Economic Growth. Um, so really, economic growth, I view, is one of the most important topics in macro. Um, the famous economist Robert Lucas said that uh, once you start thinking about economic growth, it's really hard to think about anything else. And I think the reason he said that is because it's, it's hard to find another area of economics that can impact so many people so profoundly as economic growth. So throughout the course of the three-part series, we're going to first build the solo model. Then we'll talk about applying the solo model to understand how the savings rate affects uh, a country's standard of living. And then the third part is going to talk about um, a quantitative example, show you how to solve that, and then um, understanding what it means to be at the golden rule level of capital stock. To me, economic growth is one of the most important topics in macroeconomics. Um, few other things have the ability to impact as many people as profoundly as changing the long run um, level of prosperity in, a, in an economy. Uh, so to see that, we're going to look at a couple of um, visual displays of, of data here that, that really drive this point home. Um, so I want to point out first that the, the slide is actually wrong. This, on the, on the left-hand side, the axis is not dollars per day. This is actually the percentage of the world population living on $1.90 per day, $3.20 per day, and $5.50 per day at the blue line. So you can see 40 years ago, 65% of the world's population was living on less than uh, $6 a day, and um, over 40% of the population was living on less than $2 a day. Fast forward to more recent times, and the fraction of the population uh, that's, that's surviving on less than $2 a day is below 10% uh, and still declining. So that's the power of economic growth. It's raising literally billions of people out of poverty and giving them a chance to um, live more productive and uh, enjoyable lives. It's also important to note that over this time period, there was substantial globalization. Um, so the spread of uh, market ideals and, and uh, freely determined prices and that sort of thing, uh, more international uh, dependence, international trade, and so the degree to which we have experienced more economic openness and economic freedom um, has resulted in this, this large decrease in the percentage of people that are living in abject poverty. Um, so if you think about $1.90 per day, well, there's only 365 days in a year. So we're talking about less than $1,000 per year that uh, uh, this fraction of the population is uh, surviving on. Why is uh, economic growth so effective at, at producing these increases in the standard of living? Well, the secret is really compounding um, rate, rates of growth. So just like uh, putting money in your savings account, you earn interest on the interest. So uh, the same sort of thing happens with um, the growth rate of GDP. So even a small change in economic growth, so if we go from a 2% growth rate to 2.5% growth rate, so over 25 years, there's a substantial increase um, uh, if we're talking the, in the super long run out to 100 years, the, uh, the increase is even more dramatic. So any small change in policy that we can uh, implement to achieve these incrementally, incrementally larger rates of growth are going to have a substantial impact on our standard of living out into the future. And as I've already alluded to, one of the key questions that economic growth can help us understand is why are some countries poor and some countries much more wealthy? What distinguishes these two types of countries. If you're a poor country, how do you become one of the rich countries over time? What sort of policies can help you achieve that growth that's so desirable? Um, and then finally learn how uh, the growth rate is affected by different types of government policies and things that happen in the world, sort of random occurrences that we call uh, shocks, economic shocks. So remember in chapter three, we, we built a model of the economy that was also looking at the long run, but we had some uh, very restrictive assumptions. We assumed that K was fixed at some number K bar and that the labor supply was also fixed at some number L bar. So now we're not going to uh, hold that hold that to be true. So we're going to allow capital to grow over time. And so the way that we get a, a larger capital stock is by taking some of the, the uh, income we're producing and investing it into 
the capital stock, right? So we have these two forces that are going to work upon capital. Investment causes it to grow, but over time, machines wear out. Um, factories, um, you know, need to be repaired and that sort of thing. Computers become obsolete. So this idea of depreciation means that your capital stock is wearing out every period, so it's shrinking a little bit uh, as, you, as you move forward in time. So we're not going to assume that the population is fixed so that the amount of people working can grow now. So um, we refer to this phenomena as population growth. So the population is going to be growing at some fixed rate n. You will also be happy to know that the, con function, the consumption function excuse me, is simpler. So other ways that the model is different from Chapter 3, so we are not explicitly including G or T, government spending or taxes. Um, so these sorts of things can still be thought of as happening outside of this model, and we can see what happens when those things change. In other words, we can still do fiscal policy experiments and see how a change in taxes or government spending impacts this model. You just, you just aren't going to see these two variables show up explicitly. Um, the one thing that will show up explicitly is savings. And remember, changes in G or T will affect national savings. So that's the sort of link that we can, get, uh, we can use to get from G and T to the solo model. And there are various other cosmetic differences. The big one is going to be this idea of talking about variables in terms of per worker values. So uh, we'll dive into that in just a minute, but everything is going to be in a per person uh, measurement style. So again, when we're talking about economic growth and standard of living, the most common way to measure that is GDP per capita, goods and services stuff per person, right? So um, the reason we do that is because the size of your economy, right, it can be very large, but if you also have, you know, 3 billion people, then the stuff per person can still be small. So that's a way, uh, using this G GDP per capita as a way to control for the population size, essentially, to, to see how a typical person is faring in this economy. It's going to be very important in this model to differentiate between aggregate values and per worker values or per capita values. So whenever we see a capital letter, this is the aggregate value. So this is total GDP. This is everything that's produced in the economy in a, in a certain time period. Whenever we see a little um, version, lowercase value, uh, or version of the, the variable, this means we're talking about per worker, per capita terms. So little y is big Y divided by L, the number of workers. Similarly, little k is the aggregate capital stock, total capital, divided by the number of workers. So we would read this lowercase k as capital per worker. So what we're going to do first is convert um, our production function to this per worker format. Um, so we can do this using the assumption we made it be previously in chapter three that the uh, production function is constant returns to scale. So if you remember constant returns to scale means if we multiply the inputs all by the same number, we multiply the output by the same number. So if we increase K and L by a factor of Z, we will also increase the output by a factor of Z. So we're going to use a little algebraic trick here. Essentially, it's say that Z is, uh, let Z equal to, uh, is equal to 1 divided by L. So essentially what we're going to do is, uh, if we're multiplying by 1 over L, it's the same as dividing by L. So if we divide each of these terms by L, in the production function, L divided by L is just 1. K divided by L, K divided by L becomes little k, capital per worker. Divide Y by L, and we get lowercase y, output per worker. So after we divide through by the number of workers, we get this per worker production function, lowercase y equals F of lowercase k, um, it's easier for me to say little y, little k, so that's what I'm going to say going forward. So little y is equal to f of little k, where um, little k, again, is, is um, capital per, per worker. It's the amount of tools and machines per worker. So typically when we graph a production function, we have labor on the x-axis and output on the y-axis. So since we're doing this in terms of um, capital per, or, you know, the input per worker, 
we're going to change things around. So the only input in the production function now is this uh, little k, capital per worker. So what we want to do is see how output per worker, little y, varies as we change the amount of capital per worker. So just as you'd expect, this is an increasing function because as we add more tools and machines per person, per worker, we're going to get more stuff per worker. Um, so notice that this increases at a decreasing rate, so there's diminishing returns to this production function, just like we saw before. And we can also say that the slope of this production function is the marginal product of capital per worker. So we also have um, a national income identity here that shows us how um, you know, our, our production is split up between its various uses. So remember before our national income identity was y equals c plus i plus g. So we're just, uh, remember, we're re removing g from this model. So now we're, we have a little bit simpler expression. Output y is equal to consumption plus investment c plus i. So all of the stuff we're producing is either consumed or invested. Those are the only two options. Now remember, everything is going to be in per worker terms, so we need to convert our um, national income identity from aggregate terms. Remember the capital letters here, this is our aggregate relationship. If we simply divide all of these variables by L, we put this in per worker terms. So y, uh, big Y divided by L is little y, big C divided by L is little c, and big I divided by L is little i. So this is consumption per worker and investment per worker. So our consumption function is also simplified. So um, our consumption is going to be um, just determined by this, this parameter that we're going to call S, our savings rate. So S, the savings rate, is the fraction of our income that is saved. So S is just determined somewhere outside of this model. We're taking it as given. So remember, we call that exogenous. So S is an exogenous parameter. Um, and that's actually one of the shortcomings of this model is that uh, you can critique it very easily and say that, well, this savings rate shouldn't just be some number that's taken as given. It might depend on all these other things that are happening in the economy. Um, so that's why, um, you know, this is the baseline, but we eventually will talk about endogenous growth models that sort of allow this savings rate and uh, investment in technology and those sorts of things to be endogenous, part of the model. So also note that S is, this little s is not uh, in per worker terms. This is just a fraction. So if you save 20% of your income, then S is equal to 0.2. So our consumption function then is consumption is equal to 1 minus S times Y. 1 minus S, if, if we're saving S, fraction S, then we are not saving a fraction 1 minus S. So we're consuming whatever we don't save, in other words. So C equals 1 minus S times Y. So there are a couple of different ways to make sense of this, um, the amount saved. So I happen to think it's easiest to go directly to this relationship here. So if we're saving a fraction of our income S, the savings per worker is the savings rate multiplied by the output per worker. So we're, we're saving a fraction S times Y. But also keep in mind that uh, what we're saving intuitively is what's left over after we consume. So Y minus C is what we are saving. Um, and remember, we just determined that C is equal to 1 minus S times little y. So if we do the algebra there and, and uh, collect terms, then we just end up with S times uh, little y. So now our national income identity is Y plus C plus I. So if we rearrange this, we now get a relationship between investment and savings. Um, so remember, this is going to be just like before. So if we rearrange this, investment is equal to y minus c. So all we did is, is subtract c from both sides in this expression here. So investment is equal to um, whatever's left over from income after we consume. And that's the same thing that we identified up here, right? So investment is equal to savings. Investment per worker, savings per worker. So this investment equals savings relationship is the same as before. And so the, the final little connection we can make here is that, so we've determined that investment is equal to savings. So if we just substitute in the production function for little y here, so s times little y is the same as s times f of k. So remember y, uh, y is equal to the production function on the production side. So we can say that investment is equal to the fraction s of our income that is saved. 
all of the algebra can be a little confusing, so um, I really think it's helpful to visualize these relationships, and for a lot of people, this will make more sense. So let's go back to the graph of our, um, of our production function. So the green line here is just our production function. This is f of k. So it's the relationship between capital per worker and output per worker. So now we can add this um, new line on here that is called our investment function. So remember, we just determined that investment is equal to savings, which is the fraction of our income that is saved. So S times F of K, because Y is, is, is equal to F of K, right? So we can call this our investment function. And so just like with output, right, um, the more capital per worker we have, the more we can invest. So this is an increasing function. So as long as output is increasing and we're saving a constant fraction, our investment's going to be increasing as well. So in terms of the vertical heights here, so you can talk about um, the green line being total production. So remember, total production is split between two things, consumption and investment. So the height up to the red line is the amount we're investing. So that must mean the rest of it is our consumption, right? So the red line to the green line is the amount of consumption per worker. So remember, we also said that some of our capital stock is um, depreciating over time. And so um, what we can do now is graph the relationship between capital and the amount of depreciation we are going to experience. So an important parameter in the model is this um, delta here. So delta is the rate of depreciation. So um, we're assuming that the rate of depreciation is constant, so each period uh, a fraction delta of the capital stock is going away. So you know, this is going to be a relatively small number. So uh, if 10% if of the capital stock is, is wearing out each period, delta would be equal to 0.1. So uh, commonly we'll talk about depreciation being something in the neighborhood of, of um, 2, 3, 4, 10%, somewhere, somewhere in that range. Um, and so if the, the rate of depreciation is constant, we're going to get a linear relationship, a straight line relationship. So um, the, amount of the amount of depreciation for any given amount of capital is going to be the height of this line. It's going to be delta times whatever the capital per worker is. All right, so now we've talked about the two different components here. Um, and so what we're going to do now is create what I'm going to refer to as the basic solo model graph. So if I ever say use a model of this, uh, a graph of this, uh, the primary graph from the solo model to answer a question, this is the graph I'm talking about. And so we're going to build it in simple form here, and then we're going to add a few things as we go along uh, throughout this chapter in chapter nine. Um, so the key things that we need to include, okay, so we're going to have this, this um, Cartesian coordinate plane here. So on the y-axis, we're going to look at two different variables. We're going to look at investment, and we're going to look at depreciation. Right, so we have two different variables that we're going to measure on the y-axis, and we're going to be seeing how these two variables change as we change little k, capital, per worker. So first I'm going to add our investment function, and so this was our s times f of little k. So remember it kind of was this line that increases at first and flattens out at the top because we have diminishing returns. So this is f times f of little k, right? So this is our investment, right? And so now we can also talk about measuring depreciation on the y-axis. And so the relationship between little k and depreciation was a straight line. So we can add this straight line, sort of straight line. That's supposed to be a straight line, right? And so this is our delta times little k. So this shows us how much is depreciating over time. Uh, and so this is the basic setup for the solo model graph. Um, and so as you're looking ahead, what a, a key important part here, anytime you see a graph in economics, good things happen where two curves cross. So your attention is probably drawn to this part right in the uh, here where the depreciation function crosses the uh, investment function. So that's going to be important. Uh, and in fact, this is what we are going to call our steady state, our equilibrium. Okay, so this is what we're going to refer to as little k star, and we will henceforth refer to this as the steady state 
value of capital per worker. Steady state is just kind of a, a macro term for the long run equilibrium. So this is gonna be the level of capital per worker that the economy tends to gravitate towards to in the long run. This is where we're, what we're going to approach. And I forgot they had a little depreciation uh, term here. So there you go. Now the model is complete and we will talk about how to use this diagram to see how the economy behaves over time. Um, and uh, it'd also be the basis for understanding some quantitative examples um, uh, and the golden rule level of capital stock that we'll talk about in part three.